Um, important things to remember from the beginning. We are recording the meeting. Um, the video will be posted to the NERSC YouTube channel um, uh, shortly after the meeting. Also, from today, for, for those who just joined, um, you should be able to see a live transcript, which uh, hopefully makes things yeah, a little bit easier than following only the audio. I suspect that most of us by now are already on Slack, but just in case you're not, here's the link in the chat. This is a great um, we call it forum place for uh, discussions amongst you know, users or nurse users, including uh, chat during this meeting. One of the advantages of uh, chatting in Slack compared to the Zoom chat is that the chat continues to be visible after the meeting's finished and can continue the conversation. Okay, so we'll follow our normal agenda. Um, this is intended to be a, yeah, an interactive um, forum. It's a, it's a discussion, not a presentation. So please unmute yourself and speak up when you have uh, something to add. Um, also, you know, use the, the uh, Slack channel. For discussions sort of during this meeting, we tend to use the uh, hashtag webinars channel of Slack. Uh, just, just for sort of containing things. Okay, and uh, agenda will follow our normal pattern. We'll start with uh, the stories of uh, win of the month uh, and its flip side today I learned. We have a, a whole bunch of announcements and, and CFPs and we'll be interested in hearing any more that uh, our users have. And then we'll go into our topic of the day. We're going to talk about the NUG Executive Committee and uh, what's involved and how you can participate. And a uh, uh, brief look at what's coming up and last month's numbers. So kicking it off with win of the month. So the purpose of this uh, segment is to go uh, for our users to be able to show off an achievement or to shout out somebody else's achievement that they're aware of. So for instance, if you've uh, just had a paper accepted if you've been working on a, a challenging bug and found a solution or you know, stumbled across something that is uh, a, a really good tip. Um, scientific achievements are always good. We have, uh, every year we have um, high impact scientific achievement awards and also awards for innovative use of high performance computing. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, this forum is a good kind of your opportunity to uh, you talk about things that you've uh, seen or done that might actually be candidates for those. Uh, also, candidates for uh, science highlights, uh, interesting and attractive. So we'd uh, love to hear about them. Anybody like to kick us off? What's uh, interesting, successful? Even award worthy that you've uh, achieved or seen in the last month or so. We have uh, some silent slides. To, uh, I just saw a little bit of movement, maybe not. Maybe we'll jump straight to the next one or extend it out into the other side of the coin. The uh, today I learned and this, uh, this can be something that tripped you up. It can be something that you're still stuck on even. Um, or just something that you stumbled across that might uh, benefit other nurse users. Or might uh, help us to identify things that we can tweak in our documentation as well.
we uh, quite meeting as well? I'll give some. Uh, so I added some documentation on the interactions of Cori GPU module with the regular queues. Oh, you know, uh, earlier uh, last week, like you cannot submit to Haswell or KNL if you have the CGPU uh, module loaded. Yes, that's a that's a good tip. Actually, I um, I do remember seeing that go through, and yeah, that's uh, a really helpful tip. That that's a, a really easy one to trip up on as well. The the Slurm error messages are not always obvious, so so thanks for putting that in. That's um, actually also a, a good reminder if you haven't discovered it already. When you're looking at the nurse uh, docs pages of docs.nurse.gov, there is a button on the page. Up here. Um, this is the GitLab source for the nurse docs. So if you see an error or um, you notice something that would be helpful to add. You can go there and that will take you to the GitLab, GitLab page uh, where you can uh, clone the repo and make uh, a merge request against it. So that we can see uh, yeah, things that we might have missed that are worth adding. So yeah, thanks for doing that, Will. I think there are going to be a, a few uh, tips coming up in the um, announcements, actually. There's a quite a bunch of uh, interesting training and so on. So if uh, yeah, nobody else has uh, got something that they'd like to add, we'll um, go on to this. So we have a bunch of stuff that's already in the weekly email, so you can go back and check that for the details. Um, important things to watch out for. Um, we have an upcoming Cori OS update planned for September. Uh, there'll be a new programming environment, new default modules, and a particular change to be aware of and prepared for is that if your executables are statically linked, you will likely need to relink them. The uh, previously, you know, the, the existing uh, static executables may not work. Dynamically linked executables should be fine. Um, but yeah, so, so once that um, update has happened, you may need to do a, a relink of things. So it's just a heads up that it's coming. Uh, you may have noticed that the Cori burst buffer is currently unavailable. Um, we did have a, a, a few users, I think, who um, noticed this by, by seeing their jobs, I guess, uh, sitting in the queue rather than seeing the message of the day. So there is a, a note about it on the um, uh, my.nurse.gov uh, yeah, system status sort of dashboard page. Um, but it means that if you have burst buffer jobs, they're probably just sitting in the queue waiting. We're uh, anticipating an up, uh, you know, a, a fix for that problem soon, but it's not there yet. So don't keep uh, watching email for updates on that. Uh, other significant thing that's coming up very soon is it is very nearly OCAP season. Uh, October, uh, sorry, September 7 is when the OCAP um, submissions will be open. There are a couple of differences in this year's process compared to previous years. And so next NUG meeting, uh, Clayton will walk us through the process of uh, submitting an OCAP request and you know, what, what you need to know for this year. So don't miss that. Uh, also on September 7, it will be is when the uh, quarterly allocation reductions are planned to occur. So that's uh, uh, a way for uh, program managers to you know, get more available hours to uh, you know, or, or to redistribute the hours rather by uh, taking a few hours away from uh, allocations that are not using them at a fast enough rate to use them all up and making them available but for program managers to you know, redistribute sort of as needed. 
Um, let's see, so if we have even more. Um, this is a, a good source of today I learned stuff actually. I've, I've learned a lot of uh, interesting things out of this, um, this series. So the Better Scientific Software um, series is part of the uh, ECP Ideas Project. And it's aimed at improving uh, software development practices and tools, uh, particularly, yeah, particularly with an eye to scientific software development. So this is yeah, quite close to our hearts here, I think. Um, and so that uh, organization, I guess, has just recently announced a fellowship program. So the uh, Better Scientific Software 2022 fellowship program applications are now open. So this is targeting uh, work that uh, fosters practices, processes, and tools to improve scientific software productivity and sustainability. And there are uh, grants available for, for this that are up to 25K. So this can be a, you know, a good source if your uh, research and work is in that direction. Uh, the weekly email has details and you know, links for you know, how to apply more, more information. Uh, there's a, a bunch of uh, calls for participation out there at the moment. Uh, some, you know, some of the more recent ones that uh, we've seen. The Women in HPC workshop has a CFP out that will happen in uh, conjunction with SC21. Also in conjunction with SC21, the International Workshop on Performance, Portability and Productivity in HPC, uh, and also Supercheck, which is the uh, Check My Brew Start forum that is uh, uh, being what do you call it, chaired by uh, uh, Zenji from Desk. So I think he's a uh, yeah, yeah, good one to, uh, to find out about and to get involved in. Uh, so this is the, the summary of the current ones that uh, I know of. Does anybody else have or know of any calls for participation that would be interesting or beneficial to the NEST users? I see there's a question in the chat about the prognosis for burst buffer. Um, well, it, it will come back, but we're waiting on a fix. So I don't know the timing at this point. Yeah, Steve, we can, we can, we can follow up on the, um, the exact timing of it and see um, if we can get an update today. Yeah, so we can circle back around to that uh, offline later. Uh, a bunch of training things coming up in the near future. Um, in the very near future, next week, there is some CMake training. I think that's for the first four days of the week. Also, around the end of next week, I think, is uh, an introduction to kernel performance analysis with NVIDIA Insight Compute. So this will be uh, useful for preparing for Perlmutter and running in GPUs. Uh, uh, spelling error in this next one. Uh, I believe it's an L, Valorium for, for uh, portable power management code. It has sessions um, tomorrow and in about a week's time. Further ahead in September, there'll be a session on facility testing of E4S, which is the what's it called? extreme scale scientific software stack. Um, so facility testing using the E4S test suite, spec test and build test, and that will be in, uh, in the middle of September. Also in the middle of September is the next Ideas ECP webinar on leading open source projects. So this is attached to that uh, same better scientific software that, that the uh, fellowship announced. And then further ahead in October will be a uh, E4S deep dive. So E4S has got uh, yeah, quite a, a good range of um, scientific uh, software and you know, particular libraries. So it's uh, worth a look. Are there any others that uh, I didn't know about?
this is a good opportunity to you know shout out for um, conferences that you're you know participating in or or um, you're on the committee for. Okay, so we're running slightly ahead of schedule, but that's okay. Our topic of the day for today is the NUG Executive Committee. Um, so we'll do a bit of a walk through what the committee is, what it does. And uh, so Richard's online and may uh, uh, speak up for, uh, at uh, any point and add notes uh, uh, which has been involved with Nuggets for you know, from NERSC side for quite a while. We may even have a few Nuggets members on the call with us. So to begin with, what is NUG? Um, well, hopefully everybody knows that since you know <laughs> us or you know, the the people here. Uh, NUG. It's the NERSC user group, and it in, inherently includes all active NERSC users, and it's designed to be a forum for users to communicate with each other and with NERSC staff yeah, for the benefit of the NERSC user community. So uh, activities include uh, discussions around the, the use of NERSC, uh, sharing of knowledge and experience, hearing from representatives of NERSC and stakeholders, and engaging in other related activities, including participating in special interest working groups and having interactions with other relevant groups to NERSC, such as the Society for Science and User Research Facility, something called SSERF. And I see uh, uh, Dan has his, his icon, icon on Zoom here, SSERF. Um, and so, you know, this meeting is a NUG activity. And yeah, those are pretty much exactly the goals that we have here, sharing knowledge and experience and discussing the use of NERSC. Uh, so NERSC hosts for NUG a uh, NERSC users Slack channel, which I think we're all uh, yeah, aware of at this point and uh, yeah, fairly active on. Uh, so this is a, a, a forum where users can interact with other NERSC users. And in a, a, a more ad hoc way, you know, NERSC staff often yeah, jumps on and uh, contributes to the conversation there. And the other thing, and you know, didn't mention this in the uh, upcoming event, but it is an upcoming event. NERSC hosts an annual NUG meeting, which is open to all users. And it uh, generally includes presentations by NERSC, by uh, its DOE sponsors, by NERSC users, by vendors, and also some training and workshops. And so, yeah, we're actually planning for that to happen this year in October. The exact details and date will uh, be announced soon. But in fact, what we'll do is we'll kind of replace this monthly meeting in October with the NERSC user group wider meeting. So that's what NUG is. What about NUGX? So the NUG Executive Community uh, Committee is a group of NERSC users who oversee NUG activities for the benefit of NERSC user community, which uh, you know, is, is more than eight thousand researchers across you know, the, the whole DOE Office of Science, all all scientific domains. So typical NUGX activities include. Uh, helping to identify HPC needs from NERSC users and scientific communities, helping us to identify training needs for NERSC users, um, suggesting and proposing topics with, uh, and activities related to the NUG annual meeting, yeah, also, uh, also for this meeting, uh, coordinating activities at meetings and conferences where NERSC users and or NERSC staff contributions would be valuable, and also hearing from NERSC about uh, important topics. So how does it work and what's involved? So all NERSC users are invited to volunteer to serve on NUGX. You don't have to you know, have a, a particular 
you know, length of time using NERSC or, or a particular role where we're interested in a, a wide range of input. Uh, and uh, NERSC will select representatives with the aim of representing as diverse and broadly inclusive span of NERSC users, projects and HPC needs as we can. So yeah, we wanna make sure that uh, yeah, everybody's needs are um, you know, heard and uh, addressed. So, so we're uh, very interested in having a, you know, a really good diverse group in, uh, in NUGX. Uh, so NUGX will meet regularly, uh, typically up, up to about one hour per month. So it's, it's you know, intended to be a, a not too heavy uh, commitment. Um, yeah, a meeting with NERSC staff for activities such as uh, the ones we talked about before, identifying needs from NERSC users and some scientific community, identifying training needs, um, providing topics or activities that we should consider for the NUG annual meeting, uh, coordinating activities at conferences, uh, proposing and scheduling uh, this meeting topics and hearing from NERSC about important things. So if you uh, join NUGX, uh, typically NUGX members will serve for two to three years, you know, as long as they continue to be active NERSC users. If, you, if you're no longer using NERSC, then it's a bit difficult to be representative. Um, but we, you know, it's, it's good to have some sort of continuity. So the NUGX chair and co-chair are chosen from amongst the NUGX members. Um, they kind of serve as the, the primary points of contact for NUGX uh, and they, yeah, they help to advise on the structure and the content of the annual meeting. And the chair and co-chair serve one year terms in kind of a, a rolling fashion. So each year the co-chair succeeds from the previous year's chair and yeah, a new co-chair is, uh, is selected. So and the terms for NUGX members are staggered. So the aim is for about yeah, a third to a half of NUGX to be replaced every year. And the reasoning for this is that we have a, a combination of you know, continuity and you know, fresh ideas and you know, wider representation. So we still have uh, you know, people who have been there for at least a year to be able to you know, guide the new members of the committee uh, into their role and new members to bring new ideas and enthusiasm. All right, why should I get involved? There are a, a few benefits, but importantly, it, uh, it's a, a great way to contribute to the NERSC user community. So your input on NUGX yeah, can help NERSC to best serve the needs of researchers supported by DOE Office of Science. Uh, yeah, it also sort of puts you in the inner circle. You get some uh, you know, closer insights into how NERSC works. And uh, yeah, you'll also sort of have a, a, an avenue to alert NERSC to concerns or events that are happening in your scientific community that uh, you know, we might not have uh, a, a direct connection or you know, a direct um, interaction with or you know, as, as uh, loudly. So yeah, you'll be able to kind of be in that uh, inner circle. Uh, there's also kind of a, a cross-pollination aspect because you'll be working you know, reasonably closely with other people from diverse scientific domains you know, who have all got uh, different, you know, innovative approaches to challenges. There's this sort of an opportunity to see how other areas of science are solving problems that may actually be related to, um, you know, scenarios that you're working on. So there's a, a great opportunity to you know, swap ideas. And, you know, in fact, uh, this meeting here is also a, a great opportunity to swap ideas. But in the uh, no experience, I guess you, you're in a, you know, a smaller, um, you know, tighter interacting group. So timeline, so we were planning for a NUG annual meeting in October, which means time's actually getting a little bit tight for um, volunteering or nominating people to join NUGX. We, so we're, we're looking for volunteers and nominations uh, kind of you know, by the end of August so that we can select new members for NUGX early in September. Uh, and then we'll have the no, annual meeting in October, at which the uh, retiring and continuing community, member, uh, community members will be recognised 
and the incoming committee members announced. And then the new committee officially begins its tenure at the, you know, the start of the new allocation year in January, uh, but the new members will be invited to join the meetings during that um, period between, you know, between October and January so that they can you know, get a, a feel for what happens and uh, you know, become a, a bit more familiar with it. So hopefully this is, uh, you know, piqued your interest and um, desire to, to be a part of the community and of this community. Um, so to, to volunteer, or if uh, it's making you think of somebody in, in your scientific community who you think would be really good to have on the committee, uh, you can also nominate a colleague. Um, to do that, please fill in this short form. So actually what I can do is paste this link into the chat. Maybe I can paste this link into the chat. In a long version of the link. Um, so this is what the form looks like. It's not too long. Um, a few simple questions and then some optional additional information that helps us. Where's the chat? Here we go. So that uh, link will be posted in um, weekly emails coming up and also on the web page fairly soon. So that's an overview of Nuggets and what's coming up. Um, does anyone here have any questions, suggestions, comments or other input they'd like to add? Uh, hi, uh, this is Koichi from PNL. Um, yeah, thanks for the interesting information. I one thing I really noted is the uh, the uh, Nugex elections participation rate is 0.1 percent of the of NASC users. So I guess we need to make more advertisement and um, something related. Then I have been. Uh, had this question sometime, but is it possible uh, for like in our my division at PNL working on atmosphere science using global change simulations, we have sort of um, informal seminar each month that you know we bring in guests from outside and talk about some ideas, exchange information for this kind of seminar event at each you know, individual institution. Can we, is it possible to invite one of the NASC help desk member as a speaker or maybe joint speaker? I can be one of the presenters together with one or two uh, NASC staff members to give some presentation about how, Na how NASC works and what kind of sort of common sense procedure is assumed and what kind of events and then maybe we can advertise those uh, how you know people can get involved in, in NAS because I didn't know about this uh, uh, NUGEX actually until I know one of my colleagues uh, a NUGEX committee member and uh, yeah so yeah so again going back to the question is there any previous examples that you know any institution invite NASC help desk member as a speaker for some seminar kind of um, event and uh, if it's possible I'd like to give it a try. Yes Steve I'll, t I'll take that one I guess um, yes very much so we, we would love to do that oh, okay. um, and we'd like to encourage anybody else that's listening that would like to have something similar to just contact us yes that's uh, it's a great way for us to um, communicate with the different communities is, is to participate in things like that. So yes, that definitely. Okay, thank you. I'll get contact uh, maybe later. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that sounds great, thanks. So yeah, it is a, a good avenue for making uh, stronger connections between NERSC and, and your scientific community.
Um, Richard, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, say or, or mention around Nugex that we didn't cover here? Um, I don't think so, other than, um, you know, we've had Nugex um, has been in existence for quite a while, and, and we really appreciate the people that have taken part in it. Um, but we don't feel like whatever model we've had in the past has been as um, consistent and effective as we had hoped. Um, and part of it is everybody's busy and we're just not sure what the model is. And, you know, we'd like, uh, we'd like to have more interactions and kind of a more dynamic um, uh, Nugex. And so that's why we're trying something a little bit different here and asking for volunteers and, and trying to be a little bit more specific about the kind of activities that we would have. And um, so we're just, we're just trying uh, to tweak things a little bit to, to make it a, a more effective um, organization. Because we, you know, we think it's, it's really important for us to kind of interact and can keep, keep our finger on the pulse of the community and, you know, all of our community, um, all of our different communities. You know, Nurse Severe has a very diverse user community. And this is um, our attempt to, to, to try to enhance that a little bit. Yeah, and, that, and that's probably part of, um, you know, that having a, a really diverse community at, at Nurse is probably part of why it's, it has been kind of difficult in past years to get sufficient votes in an election, uh, you know, because I suspect a lot of the, the nominees, you know, most of the NERSC user community, you know, won't actually know. They might be known in their own scientific community, but, uh, you know, not so widely. So um, by, by taking this approach this year, we're, we're hoping to, you know, I guess, uh, kind of you know, widen the representation and, you know, and help make um, the, the different scientific communities you know, a, a little bit uh, better known to each other. So I see uh, Stephen has a comment in the chat. Uh, that's uh, good to see that it was uh, enjoyable and, and useful. Uh, different categories of field. Yeah, we do have it broken down by office, but even within offices, like some offices like BES are, are very diverse and BER are very diverse. Uh, and uh, we would find that we, we weren't really capturing uh, the broad demographics that we thought we needed to all the time. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, it's just kind of inconsistent. Yeah, and uh, actually to that end, you'll see on the um, the participation form. Interesting. Um, one of the you know, optional questions that we're asking is, you know, for, for a little bit about, um, you know, the, the volunteer or nominee. Uh, so, yeah, you know, because we're, we're interested in getting, you know, both experienced users and, you know, early career or graduate users and people who you know, directly run jobs, as well as people who use data from jobs that somebody else has run, people who manage projects. You know, we're trying to cover the, the entire range of uh, experiences that people are uh, coming to NERSC you know, for. So yeah, don't feel like you know, intimidated or that you don't have a, a place just because you're either particularly junior or you know, you don't run jobs or, you know, um, yeah, we're, we're very interested in hearing from, you know, all of these perspectives. Um, can I ask another question? Kind of related. Uh, but do we have uh, some statistics of uh, demography of the NASC users? Because we are showing the screen you know, the abuse software, senior research, mid-career, early career, and like, uh, or more, I'm more interested in the, uh, what kind of tasks a users do is abuse software or run the job or analyze data. 
uh, how many of the users are categorized into one of those, you know, groups and how much others are doing some other task that kind of gives diversity, but also basic understanding about HPC hardware and software. Probably many of my colleagues are mainly running jobs using existing community, you know, code without knowing how to build, for example, software, because they already gives users a really nice tailored out of box script. Also, once users to get, try to do more advanced or specific experiments, they have to go into those building script. But until then, out of box already prepared the case. I'm mainly talking about those uh, um, used for the climate, like CSM, ESM, WOF. You don't need to learn pretty much anything about how to build a, a script. For WOF model, you have to know about the user guide. It gives all the steps. You just copy and paste. That's it. So once something error happens or like in the code degraded status, give some um, error message. They don't know. We don't know really what to do. We even don't know how to ask questions to the help desk. So that comes back. What is the user's current demography? How many of the users are that kind of more really uh, beginning, beginner level of HPC? and how many are more like experts building software for, for HPC environment. And if we, we have such a statistics, I'm just very interested in it to see. So yeah, I can take that one too, Steve. Um, that's, that's a great, great point. We, we have an annual survey and we ask some limited number of demographic questions like um, how long have you been using ours? So we have that data, but um, right. I think that would be a great question for us to add to the annual survey, Steve. Maybe you could take a note. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, kind of how do you, how do you use NERSC and what's your ex experience level? In other words, are you, are you developing code, building code? Are you just running pre-built pre applications? Are you um, having to create batch scripts? Um, you know, what, that, that sort of thing. I think that would be, I think that'd be great information for us to have. And we don't explicitly have it now. Yeah, I think, I think we, yeah, we do have some subset of it, but not, not sort of really widely. We can... and, uh, yeah, that'd be great. And in that statistics might, statistics might give us some uh, ways to how to tailor user documentation. We may need to use like easier known uh, what do you call technical terms for certain section of the document and I tried to suggest some but I just didn't have a chance to <laughs> go into the uh, yeah the, the, the GitLab uh, and then copy those uh, last documentation myself but that's another use of those kind of uh, demography uh, data but yeah thanks for listening yeah so that's that, that's one of the things where uh, looking for I guess for the um for the Nugex uh, committee meetings as a, a you know, as a forum to you know, make sure that we yeah, hear about some of those. And there's also some uh, good input, I think, to be um, you know, gained about you know, what's, what are good things to focus on for training sessions, or for training events, or you know, what, what training events should we add to our repertoire, for instance. Yeah, that's a that, that, that's a great topic and this are great suggestions. So you might, you might want to volunteer for Nugex. Um, you know, one thing that Nugex has um, is working groups, and right now I think there's only one working group around experimental and observational data. But um, it'd be it'd be great if we could have somebody in Nugex that was interested and maybe formed a working group and maybe brought in others and nurse staff could participate too, and maybe you had you know regular if not that frequent meetings to discuss, you know, effective ways to present the documentation or what's lacking or what, what, um, what we could do better because, um, you know, tapping ideas from our community is, is a fantastic way to help us improve how we do things because there's, there's so much knowledge and talent and perspective out there. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the comments, yeah. Thanks.
indeed, that kind of team for documentation and training program might be really nice. And I, I do like, by the way, YouTube playlist for the new user training event and us. I recommend that playlist to every new users in our group who study to use now. So we might advertise that more as well. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, thanks for the, uh, the feedback. Yeah, I see, thanks, thanks, Kishi. I see Stephen has a hand up. The Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center used to have a very interesting support model in which one staff member would be assigned to a research group and he would be your primary contact. So he got to know your code and got to know the users and you'd kind of go there with your first line inquiry. And I found that was quite effective at the time. I have to say, I, I do like that idea. We, we have a, a slight challenge in that there's, there's something in the order of seven or 800 projects at desk. So I, so I guess part of what we're hoping for in, uh, in Nugex or aiming at in Nugex is to, to kind of yeah, act as that uh, or part of that liaison. So what you would want to do at NERSC, I think, would either pick out the largest allocations or if possible, the groups that have the most inquiries. We do do that at some level with our NESAP teams. We have about 50 different, um, it's mostly based on codes, but not entirely um, mm -hmm. projects. And each one has a designated contact person and liaison. Um, yeah, we do have that, but I guess I consider that person mostly available for uh, porting codes to the new machines, not right. so much for the production running problems we're having. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a good um, idea to bring up again. You know, we have we've thought about how we might do that in the past. Um, we haven't really implemented anything too much, except we, you know, we do, we do have some people that work with different communities, but it's not on a real organized structure. We don't have a real organized structure around that right now. Um, but we'll think more about how we might be able to do that. Um, you would especially have if we were able to identify communities that um, could benefit from this kind of an interaction that you know would reduce the number of, uh, of groups that were, as it were. Yeah, you would know how to char characterize all the support tickets that are coming in at NERSC, since you have the database to examine. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Sure. Can I further follow up from Steve's uh, suggestion? Because it sounds so good to me. Uh, even uh, if the Steve mentioned, uh, I mean, Steve uh, Leek mentioned, if the resources is uh, one problem, uh, can we ask PIs to even provide some funding so that PI can provide some funding to NASC help desk? And then in, in return, we can have some designated, semi-designated point of contact to port the code and uh, change the code. Uh, those kind of framework, maybe as a part of the RCAP application, if PI is interested in hiring sort of those point of contact, maybe they can include that. Or as a user facility, everything everything has to be sort of free based at NASC. Yeah, you know, um, that's a, that's an interesting idea. Um, an idea I've had in the past, and the thing that I think would be really useful um, is if I think it'd be really I think it'd be really useful if uh, projects, particularly some of the larger projects, were able to have a designate within that group that is their nurse liaison, their nurse, nurse contact and, or, or whatever. And they could, they could sit within that group. Um, maybe they could sit within nurse, maybe half and half, um, but they would really be the coordinator um, for the interactions between NERSC and, and that group. I think that would be, uh, I think that would be potentially a really nice model. Um, so, yes. I don't know what other people think about that. And I, it, the de facto happens in some groups. Some centers have an extended support model 
where when you put in your allocation, you say you would like special extended support, which could include um, developing new code, things like that. And you know, you might get your allocation with that or without it. That's a good question to ask. See, we're getting lots of good ideas here. Um, I don't know if anybody's taking notes. I don't know if Steve, you're taking notes. Um, the one thing we could ask on RCAP is, do you need extended support? And, and or would you like extended support and describe what it is? I think that'd be a good question. Hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of great ideas coming out of this group. We should uh, yeah we, we should definitely um, yeah fill in fill in the form and volunteer to be uh, yeah to join Nagex. I'm actually a Nagex member, so uh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. about that. <laughs> well, we're going to try to we're going to try to um, create more opportunities to have this sort of interactions within Nagex too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're approaching the end of our hour. So it might be time to, to wind up this discussion. Does anybody have any, any last comments or questions they'd like to make first? Um, well, let me, let me make one more, um, one, uh, not about Nugex, but just one comment and kind of a, advertisement for the next meeting, which we'll talk about allocations, is there are going to be um, some significant changes um, to the allocations process next year. Um, well, not the, not the uh, procedures by which you do things, that will pretty much stay the same. Um, but the big changes are going to be, we are going to allocate the Perlmutter GPU nodes separately from the other collection of CP, CPU nodes that we have, which include Cori, and then we will have some CPU only nodes on Perlmutter. So there'll be two pools of allocations, GPU time as it were, and, and CPU time. Um, so you'll have to put in two different numbers if you want to use both resources next year. And then the other is that we're moving away from this kind of funky um, nurse hour, um, allocation unit, which has been based on kind of a CPU hour on, I think it was Hopper years ago. And we're moving to the concept of node hours, which I think will put us in more alignment with, um, certainly with Insight and ALCC and uh, a lot of other allocation programs. So we'll have little tables and maybe even a calculator that you can convert between the current units and the node hour units, but those are two things that you really have to pay attention to. So join us next month and we'll talk about all about it. Yeah, that's going to be uh, quite important for, for uh, your ERCAP submission. You told us when ERCAP opens, when does the allocation or the request period close? Is it a month later or more? That's a good question. I don't remember. I don't remember. I'm talking about yet. On October fourth, I believe, is the date it closes. Right. So approximately one month later, four weeks later. How many groups are going to be able to run anything on Perlmutter GPUs? To know what kind of time they're going to need. Well, we did. We did push back the opening of it, and that was one of the main reasons. Is we're hoping that by the time it closes, that people will be able to do just that. Okay. David? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask real quick since Richard brought it up, the, um, uh, as far as Perlmutter, if there are gonna be different units on there, uh, is there gonna be an opportunity to, to try to benchmark code before you would put in an allocation request so you know how much allocation to ask for? Or do you have to kind of rely on a calculator that may or may not be very accurate for your yeah. particular code? That's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And um, the current timeline that we've put up there, uh, I hope that that is the case that people can get on, their, on the system itself and actually do those tests. If that doesn't happen, um, we might think about reconsidering the timeline and seeing, seeing what we can do. 
because yeah, because I do agree that you, you know you need you need you need something to to be able to judge the, the size of your request. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if I mean for small, um, if you want to do small benchmarks right now, we can get you access to some A100s that are attached to Corey. Um, and see if I don't remember what the process is for doing that, but but that is a possibility. But it's only how many nodes is it? Uh, there's only a handful of nodes. It's, yeah, you know, like you know, a, a couple or six or or something like that. So it's so it's quite small. Um, although it's probably enough to at least get a sense of the difference in performance between the A100 and the V100. So that's and that, that's still going back to kind of you know, a, a model and, and kind of calculating and estimating. But uh, so the Cori GPU nodes are V100s, which can be yeah, and there's there's uh, eighteen of those with I think eight GPUs in each. So you know, there's hopefully enough there to yeah you know, to get a, a a bit of an idea of performance and scaling. Okay, yeah, that was a good question. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, so things coming up. Um, as Richard was just saying, September's NUG monthly meeting will have a, a walk through the OCAP process and particularly the, the things that are new for the coming year, uh, especially around Perlmutter and, and GPU allocations. Uh, then in October, uh, we're planning to have the NUG annual meeting kind of in lieu of this meeting. It may, may not be on the same day. We'll, we'll uh, announce the date uh, a little bit closer. November, tentatively, um, a presentation of some of the work of uh, one of our regular participants. Uh, and on that note, we're very interested to hear kind of, you know, lightning talk presentations about, uh, you know, what you're doing and how you use NERSC. And, you know, I think, uh, yeah, other NERSC users will also find this very interesting. So if you uh, if you would like to present your work, it could be also a good uh, opportunity to do like a almost a, a practice run or a, or, or a preparatory run for uh, something that you're presenting at a conference. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, quick scan through last month's numbers. So our uh, scheduled availability was was also quite high. Uh, overall availability was a, a little bit lower. Um, the bulk of the reason for this being that we had, you might remember, a fairly large uh, center power maintenance. This is a once every three years kind of maintenance that is you know, important to do. But it meant that we were unavailable for a couple of days there over a weekend. Um, there was a, a number of, uh, fortunately, quite short outages and uh, not, not all of them were full outages, actually. I think a, a few were system degraded, so uh, things like uh, lower utilization. There was, uh, I spelled that wrong, OTP, one-time password issues, um, making it difficult to log in a couple of times. So you can see on the chart, that's kind of what it uh, looks like. Uh, core utilization overall was um, you know, nice and high, up uh, over 94%. Um, the large, Jobs numbers uh, hadn't come in yet uh, at the time of writing these slides, but we'll do an update of these before posting the slides to the uh, website after this. So that's all we have for the meeting agenda and we're right at the top of the hour. So thanks all for participating. It was a great discussion.